Um, hi everyone, uh, hello, good afternoon and welcome uh, to the What's Your Poison seminar series organised by the HERA funded uh, research project uh, Intoxicating Spaces. Uh, first of all, a little apology for myself. I I've got the Rona, um, I've got COVID, um, so I will just um, yeah apologise in advance. Uh, for any uh, coughing and spluttering. Um, today's instalment, of course, is rum, uh, and we're delighted to welcome as our speaker, uh, Dr. Jamie Goodall. Uh, Jamie is a staff historian at the US Army Center of Military History in Washington, DC, but also teaches at Southern New Hampshire University. Uh, amongst other things, she is the author of Pirates of the Chesapeake Bay, from the colonial era to the Oyster Wars, which came out in 2020, uh, and National Geographic's Pirates, Shipwrecks, Conquests, and Their Lasting Legacy, uh, which came out in 2021. Um, and she's currently uh, under contract with the History Press uh, to produce both a monograph on piracy in the Mid-Atlantic uh, and a biographical account of the pirate uh, Black Sam Bellamy. So she's busy. Um, our usual spot of housekeeping, um, as ever, Jamie will speak for around half an hour, and there they'll, 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 will then be around half an hour um, for questions and discussion. Uh, there's a little chat uh, box in the bottom right uh, where you can uh, post comments and observations throughout the talk. But if you have a question for Dame, Jamie, um, do post it using the separate uh, Ask a Question uh, button at the bottom, and you can post those as they occur to you. Uh, throughout the talk um we'll save them up until the end uh so without further ado it gives me enormous pleasure uh, to hand things over to jamie and drink up me hearties a history of piracy and rum uh and in a slight sort of change to how we normally do things uh, i'm going to be driving the powerpoint because jamie was having uh, some issues around screen sharing um so let me just get that up now and yeah jamie just let me know when you want to uh, want to progress the slides okay uh, thank yeah. you so much for having me uh, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, so I just want to give a quick thanks to Mark C. Kehoe of the website, the Pirate Surgeons Journals. Uh, he's compiled a wealth of resources on piracy and alcohol consumption. Um, and I'm also indebted to the work of Wayne Curtis and Frederick H. Smith, who have studied rum far more extensively than I have. Um, go ahead and advance slide. Uh, so pirates, of course, are often described as being mightily addicted to punch, and they're passing most of their time on shore in drinking ordinaries. For example, the pirate Captain Roberts and his crew regarded themselves quite fortunate after taking several vessels in 1720, where the cargo of liquor was so plentiful, they said it was estimated a crime against Providence not to be constantly drunk. Tales of Roberts and his crew relate that the ensuing celebration at a harbor near Old Calabar on the coast of Africa was actually a common occurrence. And in keeping with pirate custom, the time of festivity was prolonged until the want of means recalled them to reason and exertion. We also have Captain Benjamin Hornigold, who operated primarily out of the Bahamas, but often made port in Jamaica. Uh, and at both locations, he would unload his stolen cargo and participate in incredible drunkenness to the delight of local tavern keepers, but to the dismay of the provost marshal, who routinely did nothing to stop Hornigold. Rum was particularly popular because it was incredibly cheap and easy to produce. Uh, made from molasses, which is a byproduct of sugar making that had, at the time, little to no value, rum was persistently one of the cheapest spirits, and this sort of often led to its association with less savory characters like pirates. A contemporary Richard Lignan said that the sugar makers sold rum to those on the island without sugar plantations because they, quote, drink excessively of it, for they buy it at easy rates. Half a crown a gallon was the price. And so, of course, this led to the lower classes kind of being associated with the consumption of rum. And the waste from sugar production was quite substantial. For every two pounds of marketable sugar, one pound of molasses would be produced. And in the 17th century, this kind of proved to be a concern because molasses was entirely too bulky to ship without spending inordinate amounts of money. And there wasn't really a demand for molasses at the time. So for the most part, molasses was just discarded into the ocean. To give you a sense of just how much was discarded, in the 1680s, the French allegedly dumped half a million gallons of molasses a year. And they're not producing nearly as much rum as, say, the English. So you can imagine how much waste they're discarding. 
Rum's origins, however, are kind of shrouded in mystery. Uh, some argue that it was first invented in Barbados in the 17th century. Uh, the evidence for this is that the first documented references to rum or the phrase kill devil, which was another word for rum, can be found in a 1652 travel diary where a visitor to Barbados observed that um, the chief fuddling they make in the island is rum bullion, alias kill devil. And this is made of sugar cones distilled into a hot, hellish and terrible liquor. And a 1658 deed related to the sale of the three houses plantation refers to the sale of four large Maastricht cisterns for the liquor of rum. Others believe it was the creation of the inhabitants of Hispaniola or Cuba, where it was referred to as agua diente or burning water. Or was it the Portuguese on the coast of Brazil, perhaps the French in Martinique? Maybe it was invented in Europe in the 1400s or even earlier in India. But what we do know is that there was an explosion of rum production and consumption in the West Indies by the middle of the 17th century. Colonial legislatures throughout the Atlantic routinely sought to regulate and license the manufacture, shipping, and sale of alcohol, whether for practical, economic, or religious reasons. Between 1650 and 1668, for example, one cannot go a single year in the Summers Islands company records without finding laws, complaints, or court proceedings dealing with the extra legal sale of rum, wine, and beer. In 1694, Governor Isaac Fisher was accused of granting a commission to a known pirate uh, and neglected the guards of the island against other pirates. Instead, the governor was accused of tolerating and encouraging pirates, especially the quarrels, drunkenness, and debauchery that ensued. Proliferation of drinking institutions and a lack of strict regulation proved particularly important in the building of illicit commercial networks in the early modern Atlantic world. Uh, in July 1652, Governor of Bermuda, Josias Forster, proclaimed that all who kept tippling houses uh, and who allow inordinate drinking in their houses would be prosecuted to the full extent of the existing law. By 1655, approximately 900,000 gallons of Kill Devil was produced in Barbados alone. Residents were said to consume roughly 10 gallons per person per year. And in Port Royal, over 40 licenses for taverns, grog shops, and punch houses were granted in a single month in 1661, with one legal tavern for every 10 male residents. By 1690, one in four of its buildings were either brothels, gaming houses, taverns, or grog shops, and they were populated by the merchants, pirates, cutthroats, and whores of the island. This does not take into account, of course, the hundreds of unlicensed taverns operating throughout the Caribbean islands. Captain Thomas Waldeck, a visitor to the West Indies in 1708, remarked that the first thing the Spanish built upon their arrival was a church. The first thing the Dutch did was build a fort, but the English, their first buildings were taverns and drinking houses. Regulations not only tried to curb the illegal import and export of spirits, but they were also designed to prevent illegal distillation. For example, as early as 1630, travelers marveled at Barbadians' ability to distill fine rum and were equally impressed with their consumption. But as anthropologist Frederick Smith notes, Barbados had yet to develop much, if any, sugarcane crops in the 1630s. But by the 1640s, sugar had become a booming and profitable venture. And rum production in Barbados kind of reflected this reality. In the 1670s, in order to protect legal rum production and prevent excessive drunkenness, the Summers Island Company of Bermuda began explicitly prohibiting the making of rum as well as instituting duties and impositions on imported rum. Richard Lignan, of course, described how Barbadians would circumvent these prohibitions, making their own spirits, such as mobby, which was made from potatoes and roots, perino, made from cassava or manioc root, punch, made of water and sugar and whatever spirit they had available, and plum or plantain drink, made from the wild plums or plantains of the islands. The most common and less esteemed, however, was Kill Devil, or rum. It was infinitely strong, but not very pleasant in taste. Uh, according to one individual, the people drink much of it, indeed too much, for it often lays them asleep on the ground. Since wine and beer could be costly to import and could easily spoil en route to their destinations, which was particularly true given the Caribbean's reputation for bad weather, 
The local distillation of spirits, legally or illegally, provided locals and visitors with cheaply and easily available items for consumption, sale, smuggling, and theft. Now, although exportation of rum got a pretty slow start, by the mid-18th century, hundreds of thousands of gallons flowed from the West Indies, primarily to North America. Between 1726 and 1730, Barbados and Antigua exported the most rum, shipping over 680,000 gallons and 235,000 gallons, respectively. By the end of the 17th century, Barbados was producing about 1 million gallons annually, and Martinique was probably producing about half that amount. Approximately 90% of the rum exported from these islands headed to mainland North America. And these exports started to replace the declining spoils of Spanish goods as targets for pirates. Pirates not only turned their attention north, harassing British traders, but they became enamored with rum. And their turn from wine to rum may have had something to do with the fact that quite a few pirates were actually mutineers from Royal Navy ships, where they had intimate experience with rum consumption. Many of the famous pirates of the 17th and 18th centuries were actually recruited from plundered naval ships and consisted of sailors who were tired of their poor pay, limited rum rations, nutritional diseases, and the harshness of their ship's captain. Go ahead and advance slide. In the mid-1700s, sailors in the British Navy were officially given a daily ration of rum, or a tot as it became known, um, although there is evidence of the practice as early as the 1650s when the British seized Jamaica in 1655 from the Spanish. At that time, Secretary of the Navy Samuel Pepys sent a letter to a Mr. Waterhouse, a merchant on the island, giving him permission to supply King James's ships at Jamaica with rum instead of brandy. The practice continued for more than two centuries. The Association mm -hmm. of Rum and Pirates was further enforced during this time of rum rationing by the Royal Navy, who also supplied the spirit to the privateers. Many of those privateers, of course, later became pirates who raided throughout the Atlantic world. The reason for the daily rum ration? First, water and beer tended to spoil in their wooden casks, particularly when sailing in tropical climates. But the alcohol content of spirits like rum was high enough to prevent its spoiling. Second, the ration of beer on a trip was typically a gallon of beer per day. By switching to rum, they could reduce the amount of cargo they had to carry for rations since they were giving much less rum per person than beer. Third, and perhaps most importantly, it provided the men with a morale boost in the hopes that it would prevent mutiny and desertion. In the 18th century, each sailor was allotted half an imperial pint of rum a day, which is roughly the equivalent of about 10 ounces. But you have to remember that this was barrel strength, or what they called overproof rum, which would be about 150 proof. So it's kind of hard to imagine how the Royal Navy ever left the docks, let alone rule the high seas. But rum was rarely consumed alone. It was typically used in punches. In fact, it is found as a straight drink in only one naval citation, two merchant and privateer citations, and 16 pirate citations. But punch, on the other hand, is directly mentioned 72 times in the period accounts, uh, and we see that most prevalent among the pirates. In 1740, Admiral Edward Vernon officially introduced a concoction of watered down rum mixed with sugar and lime juice. This was termed grog and was supposed to reduce the drunkenness of its sailors and prevent scurvy, but many sailors saved their rations for drinking sprees anyway. And a Kind of fun fact, this is where we get the term groggy to describe that fuzzy headed feeling you get, which is often associated with a night of drinking. Go ahead and advance slide. Now there are many historical instances in which we can see the impact of rum on pirates and the influence of pirates on rum's distribution and consumption. Pirates were uh, well known for regularly taking victuals from ships they captured and from the inhabitants on shore where they would make port. And without the Crown's strict rum ration guidelines, pirate captains capitalized on the popularity of rum to gain favor of their crew. Rum was often the larger cargo and the preferred bounty aboard their ships. Rum was so popular that the scarcity of it could be the cause of out and out rebellion on pirate ships. Blackbeard, one of the most villainous pirates of the golden age, allegedly stated, such a day, rum all out, our company's somewhat sober, a damned confusion amongst us. 
Rogues a plotting, talk of separation. So I looked sharp for a prize and took one with a great deal of liquor aboard. So kept the company hot and all things went well again. In the account of Francis Spriggs' pirate crew, prisoner Richard Hawkins noted that the sta uh, sailor stationed in the crow's nest was ordered to let down a rope to haul up some hot punch, which is a liquor every man drinks early in the morning. They live merrily all day. And a Captain Jacobs brought a variety of alcohol to Madagascar-based pirates in 1698, which included rum, wine, beer, lime juice, and sugar. Similarly, an employee of the East India Company at Calicut, India, was stopped by a man from a ship anchored offshore in 1691 and was handed a letter. The letter indicated that they were pirates and that they wanted to clean their ship, get some wood and water, and uh, obtain some provisions for which they agreed to pay. When they received no reply, the pirates sent another letter warning that uh, if they did not hear anything, they would not pay for the goods, but they would come and take them. Um, the letter added, send us a hogshead of rum and sugar equivalent for punch. Apparently, they had used all of theirs up while awaiting a reply. When a man named Nathaniel Uring was observing logwood, or logwood cutters in Central America, many of whom were former pirates, he commented that rum punch is their general drink, which they'll sometimes sit devil, several days at. And as a crew of pirates prepared for the trial of men suspected to, of trying to escape from Bartholomew Roberts' crew, a large bowl of rum punch was made and placed upon the table. Once ready, the judicial proceedings could begin. And in one of Bartholomew Roberts' seizures, the merchant vessel Onslow, he imprisoned a chaplain who, according to his account, uh, they offered him a share of their pirate goods to take on with them, promising that he would do nothing for his money but make punch and say prayers. Often rum and other spirits brought out the worst in men. Uh, for example, one of Robert's men, William Davis, consorted to the idle customs and ways of living among the slaves for whom he received a wife and ungratefully sold her one evening for some punch to quench his thirst. And a merchant named George Roberts of the Margaret, who was captured by Ned Lowe's pirates, explained how a great silver bowl was brought full of punch uh, one evening, which nearly resulted in his death at the hands of a John Russell, who was apparently predisposed against Roberts uh, for some unknown reason. After a round of drinking, Russell set Roberts up and exploded in anger at the man, whipping his pistol from his sash and swearing he would shoot the man through the head. Um, but the master of the schooner prevented this from happening. Um, and then there's the incident with Blackbeard, when one night drinking in his cabin with a man named Hans, the pilot, and another man, Blackbeard, without any provocation, drew out a small pair of pistols, cocked them under the table, and when the pistols were ready, he blew out the candle and discharged them at his company. Hans was shot in the knee, forever disabling him. When asked why he did this, Teach simply damned them for asking and said, if he did not now and then kill one of them, they would forget who he was. And when pirates Olivier Levasseur, Hal Davis, and Thomas Coughlin got together on Davis's ship to discuss plans and drink, they quickly turned to fighting, the strong liquor stirring up a spirit of discord among them, and they quarreled. This was actually what ended their pirate confederation with each captain going his own way afterwards. But despite some of its issues, rum also proved to be a great recruitment tool for pirates seeking new crew members. The turnover of pirates was typically pretty high given the danger and risk, as well as the fact that many times men were pressed into service on board a pirate ship. There are a variety of examples of alcohol being mentioned as a recruitment tool. For example, during the trial of Bartholomew Roberts' men, Stephen Thomas testified that John Jessup quote, presently got drunk with the pirates and so it continued, always saying and swearing it was better living among the pirates than at Cabo Corso Castle. When testifying to the reason he joined the pirates at the trial, Robert Armstrong said that it was drink and the persuasion of the rest engaged him to it. Harry Gladsby similarly testified that Joseph Mansfield was always drunk and asleep. And because of that vice, uh, it drew him into the pirates company. And upon being convicted of piracy with Captain John Phillips' crew, William White said in his dying declaration, 
quote, drunkenness has had a great hand in bringing my ruin upon me. I was drunk when I was enticed aboard the pirate ship. According to the 1709 deposition of Lawrence Waldron, he shipped from Carolina with a Captain John Breholt, who, with the rest of his offers, officers, declared their intention to go pirating in Madagascar. Several men, getting drunk at the island, discovered the captain's intention and decided to join him. Now, unfortunately, many of those men never made it to Breholt's crew because they were arrested for public drunkenness. But the rest of the men cut cables and escaped the guns of the fort, sailing away to Africa and amassing a significant amount of treasure by piracy at Madagascar. But it wasn't always about getting drunk, however. Um, in addition to stealing small quantities of rum and other alcohol, which they used for consumption, we have many records to indicate that pirates also took large quantities of rum, more than the crew could consume, with the intent to sell it. The reason the merchant ships they took had such large quantities of alcohol on board was that it was valuable to those on land, and while pirates enjoyed alcohol, they were also interested in making money. Seizing commodities like rum proved easier than you can imagine, given that pirates had a significant advantage over merchant vessels. Fear. A pirate ship could instill fear through their reputation, their flags, their superior weaponry, as well as the number of men they had on board. The merchant ships which pirates typically targeted were minimally crewed, and a show of force went a long way to convincing a ship to give up without a fight. As a result, successful pirates usually had a fairly large crew, and that crew needed to be kept happy, a key component of which was alcohol and money. Next slide, please. Perhaps the most striking thing about the uh, pirate alcohol use data is that there's two alcohols that sort of dominate. Wine makes up 35% of the total alcohol consumed, and punch makes up 29%. So together, they comprise about 64% of all the recorded alcohol drunk by pirates during the golden age of piracy. Rum, which is the drink we most often associate with pirates in pop culture, rates a very distant third in popularity at a paltry 14%. Brandy provides the only other double-digit percentage of pirate alcohol consumed at just above 10%. So it's kind of curious that you rarely hear about wine or punch when people talk about the golden age pirates, when the data actually suggests that these were their drinks of choice. Next slide, please. Drinking could further prove pretty problematic for pirates. For example, excessive drinking often put pirates in a position where they might reveal themselves and risk being captured because of their mistake. While on St. Mary's Island in Madagascar in 1719, Captain Lewis of the St. George noted that two men he suspected of being pirates came aboard from the island who he plentifully entertained with liquor for three nights to see what information he might gather from them. They were very cautious of speaking until they got drunk, at which time they bragged about all of their loose living and their bravado. After Bartholomew Roberts' pirates were captured in Virginia because they behaved so suspiciously while imbibing their favorite alcoholic beverages, they were sentenced to hang. When they came to the place of execution, one of them called for a bottle of wine and, taking a glass of it, he drank damnation to the governor and confusion to the colony, which the rest pledged. Another episode involved a group of pirate mutineers in the Bahamas. They had taken the schooner Bachelor's Adventure and the sloops Mary and Lancaster, which had been sent from the reformed Bahamas base by Woods Rogers on a trading mission. The pirates marooned each of the crews on Green Key, and then the mutineers left to go upon the account or go pirating. Unfortunately for them, most of the, uh, the pirates were captured by the Spanish Garda Costa. Um, and the Spaniards sent the captured men back to the Bahamas. But somehow some of the pirates managed to escape, making their way to Long Key. On hearing the story of their capture by one of the men who had been released by the Spanish, Woods Rogers sent Benjamin Hornigold and Richard Turnley to capture the pirates who had escaped. When Hornigold and Turnley arrived, the mis uh, pirates mistakenly thought that it was a merchant ship. So the majority took cover so that they could ambush the men of the sloop, while two or three called out to them from the shore that they were shipwrecked. The men of the sloop came to the shore with two bottles of wine, a bottle of rum, and some biscuits. Uh, and uh, the pirates, still thinking him a merchant, asked to be put on board. They were taken a few at a time back to the ship and led to the ship's captain where, to their surprise, they saw Benjamin Hornigold, formerly a pirate, 
But what astonished them the most was to see Richard Turnley, who they had lately marooned upon Green Key. They realized that they were immediately surrounded uh, and clapped in irons. And what is perhaps most interesting from an alcohol point of view is that the rum was brought to shore in bottles when rum was typically stored in wooden casks. Uh, some historians say that this was likely done for convenience and that Hornigold's men probably filled the bottle from a cask on the ship. But uh, it's one of the first indications we have of pirates using bottles to transport. Um, in another instance of carelessness, after escaping a fleet of five vessels, Pirate Captain John Taylor and his crew caroused and kept their Christmas in a most riotous manner, destroying most of the fresh provisions they had aboard during three days of intoxicated celebration. Uh, additionally, the ship was leaking so badly that they had to make for a port where the vessel could be repaired by someone who was not incredibly drunk. And when William Snellgrave's ship was captured and looted, the pirates also drank quite heavily in celebration. Snellgrave noted that Hal Davis and Thomas Coughlin's pirates made such waste and destruction of the ship and supplies uh, that in a short time, they would realize their mistake. He also noted that while the pirates were all in a drunken fit, which held as long as the liquor lasted, no care was taken by anyone to prevent the destruction of the uh, food or goods on board. In another example, William Snellgrave again recounts being taken prisoner by pirates, um, but he remarks that the conditions were pretty relaxed and that he and some of the other prisoners had the run of the ship and they were often invited to eat and drink with Davis, the captain, uh, including large glasses of rum punch. One night, as he was at dinner with the pirate host, a cry rose up from the main deck. Turns out the ship's on fire and flames are shooting out of the hatchway that led to the hold. There's a lot of shouting, uh, but unfortunately the crew was drunk and they were unable to organize themselves to take action. But fortunately for them, Snellgrave and the other prisoners were actually sober. So they rushed below deck to investigate what happened and found that one of the pirates had been sent down to fetch more rum, but it being dark, he had a candle with him and he negligently brought it too close to the open bung of the cask, which ignited the strong rum within. The flames then set fire to the next barrel, which had also been left open. Behind them, uh, behind the burning rum, was another hold, which held 30,000 pounds of gunpowder. So you can imagine they needed to put this fire out pretty quickly. Fortunately, Snellgrave and the prisoners organized buckets of water and blankets to throw on the fire while the drunken pirates ran to the bowsprit in hopes that they wouldn't be blown up. The rest of the pirates remained on deck cheering for Snellgrave and the prisoners, and they were able to douse the flame. This time it didn't cost them their ship, but sometimes drunken carelessness did cause pirates to lose their ships. In one example, a man named John Fillmore imprisoned aboard John Phillips' pirate ship hatched a plan to capture the ship, which hinged on pirates drinking. Fillmore snuck down to the ship's galley where two pirates were, quote, drunk as beasts, so he took fire and burned them in the feet while they lay senseless so badly as to re render them unable to be on deck the next day. Because they had been drunk, they chalked their burns up to an accident. Um, uh, and Fillmore and the other men were able to get a hold of an axe and hammer, and they strategically dispatched or defeated the remaining pirates, sailing the ship into Boston and surrendering her to the authorities. Um, there are callous examples of this, but uh, since we're kind of running low on time, uh, next slide, please. I'll just kind of wrap this up a bit. Um, so from the drunken revelries organized around drinking rum with pirates shouting yo-ho-ho at a bottle of rum in Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, to Johnny Depp's character Jack Sparrow asking why is the rum gone and Pirates of the Caribbean, the Curse of the Black Pearl, Pirates and rum seem to come as a package deal in popular culture. There are even plenty of rums named after pirates like Captain Morgan, Thomas II, Black Roberts, Red Bonnie, and Blackbeard, or the obvious correlations like Pirate Kraken and Pirate's Grog. Perhaps further entrenching our association with pirates and rum is the fact that, like pirates themselves, rum has a long been associated with acts of defiance and rebellion. Rum was the reason for early bootlegging efforts when it was subjected to exorbitant taxes imposed by the English crown as part of the Sugar Act of 1764. 
and it became prized on the black market. Ultimately, these taxes led to a brisk trade in underground rum markets, which were made possible through piracy and smuggling. Once a drink of the lower classes or the riffraff, rum has since become an elevated spirit consumed by every class and found in cocktails ranging from the tropical pina colada to the classic rum and coke, from the versatile mojito to the historical planter's punch. And ultimately, it's a spirit not only with contested origins, but a complicated history. Uh, next slide. And I will end with that. Okay, I'll just I'll just let people sort of abs absorb that for a moment, uh, Jamie, before I'm um, the screen. So has everyone seen that? Brilliant. Okay, I will now stop sharing. Jamie, thank you so much um, for that uh, fascinating um, uh, and immaculately timed um, overview. Um, so uh, yeah, questions into the box, uh, please, guys, and help me out here because um, I've been completely head whammy by the COVID. Uh, my brain feels like it's full of cotton wool. Um, so uh, yeah, if you would uh, help me out, that'd be great. Um, but I have a question uh, straight away um, for you, Jamie. And it's, about, it's about sort of sources. Can I press you a little bit more um, on the sources? Am I right in thinking that it was sort of legal records um, um, sort of exist for this for this context? And can, can you perhaps sort of say a little bit more about those? Yeah, so primarily the records that uh, uh, are available are legal or government rec records. So for example, um, the Summers Island Company records from that time period have been um, transcribed and published in uh, physical volumes that you can access. Um, you can also do British History Online. Uh, they have the calendar of state papers for the America and West Indies. Uh, those volumes are, again, transcribed and digitized so you can see them. And they're keyword searchable, so that's helpful. <laughs> um, we also have trial transcripts uh, of pirates where we get a lot of this information from. So those are kind of the key pieces of information that we have. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, Jamie. We have a, we have a comment from uh, Carolyn Ann Collins. Uh, she says, excellent presentation uh, and extra special for a long addicted rum drinker. Um, there we are, yes, it just made me a little bit thirsty as well. <laughs> uh, another another um, question, yeah, tobacco. Um, I know one of the, uh, the team members, Stefan Snelders, is very interested in the sort of the connections between well sort of seafaring culture generally the piracy in particular and uh, and tobacco um and sort of smoking um is that something that you um, you, you sort of see a lot in in your records as well Jeremy? is there a, a similarly close association with pirates and smoking um i don't see it as often as i see um records with alcohol um mostly because um at least in the Caribbean, the high regulations focus on sugar production and, and that sort of thing. But when I was studying the Chesapeake, uh, because uh, the colonies of Maryland and Virginia were such large tobacco producing colonies, um, the pirates there, we have a lot of records of pirates stealing the tobacco in order to sell it to England um, yep. or uh, using the tobacco for themselves. And of course, there are a lot of regulations that kind of come out as a result of that. So um that's when i saw the most references to the tobacco trade was when i studied the chesapeake okay fantastic thank you um and we have a question in the box um from uh, from our own phil withington he says thanks very much jamie really enjoyed that uh, have you had a chance to research the investment and capital behind rum production and whether or how it overlaps with sugar planters uh i.e are they the same folk making the profits and does this um, over time yeah, I have not actually, uh, this is sort of just a side project. My focus has been more on um, the uh, ways in which pirates kind of influenced uh, consumption throughout the Atlantic world of luxurious commodities, um, rum being one of those. But I, I think uh, Frederick Smith's book, Caribbean Rum, really focuses on the economic aspect. And so it would touch more on that investment aspect and kind of uh, the ways in which rum and sugar production uh, were either profitable or not. So um, I would definitely recommend his book. Okay, brilliant. Can you just say, say, can you just say, say that again, Jamie? It's Frederick yeah. Smith. Yeah. Frederick Smith, Caribbean Rum, A Social and Economic History. Brilliant. check that out thank you very much um so uh, any more um any more questions in the box that says three 
there. Yep. Uh, Gabby Robilliard, also from the team, she says, thanks for that interesting insight into rum. Uh, she was wondering if you see any gender differences uh, in rum consumption or ways in which rum is consumed, not necessarily just amongst pirates. Again, so, goodbye. yeah, when I was looking at rum consumption in the islands in particular, uh, what we see is that the the large percentage of residents in the islands at that time were men, um, because a lot of times men were coming alone to set up sugar plantations or, or um, other uh, industries. Uh, so by and large, the records we have are of men consuming copious amounts of rum. Uh, but there is evidence of women operating taverns and grog shops and such uh, where they also consumed. And uh, typically they were relegated to separate spaces, of course. Um, but uh, it was not uncommon to see a woman partaking in the consumption of rum. You just don't see it as often as men. Brilliant. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you, Jamie. And I'm just sort of wondering, can you can you tell us a little bit more about the, the taverns and the grog shops? And I think I'm right in thinking you've, you've written an article about these, haven't you? Um, yes. <laughs> so will you, and, and that's sort of my, my interest in sort of drinking places. So can you uh, can you sort of tell us a little bit more about them and what sort of like the institutional um, sort of hierarchy and framework was um, for these sort of drinking drinking places? Right. So what I found really interesting uh, with respect to taverns and drinking ordinaries in the Caribbean islands, uh, at least early on, as opposed to, say, Europe or North America, is that in Europe and North America, they're highly um, stratified places. Uh, they're segregated based on things like race and class. And um, so, you know, you have a particular place that you go within that drinking space. But in the islands, at least early on, there's not as much uh, social segregation. Um, this is what enabled pirates to kind of uh, profit so much is that they would either make deals with merchants inside of these taverns or they would host meetings with government officials in these spaces. Um, but it was also a place where they could overhear merchants talking about ships coming in and out and use that to their advantage. Um, and so really the the major stratification that you might see in the island drinking spaces is based on race um mm -hmm. but class seemed to be less of a distinction in the islands early on um, that of course changes as the islands shift to a um, stronger plantation model and and pirates are less accepted and so the lower classes start to get kind of shut out um but at least in the early development that's kind of what i noticed Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, we've got another sort of follow on question from from Phil in the box. He says, is piratical consumption, wonderful concept, pi is piratical consumption qualitatively different to other social groups? Uh, and does it influence or inform the way others consume? Um, I would say that pirates didn't necessarily consume any more rum than your average sailor or or um your average man on the islands. Uh, again, we see the records that typically they're consuming wine and, and punch actually. Um, and so we have this idea that pirates were often more drunk than, than anyone else. But the reality is that um, they're, they're a little more discerning in their drinking habits than we tend to realize, especially because when they're on shore, they have to blend in with the population and not kind of draw attention to themselves or risk being caught by the government. Um, and the other is that uh, even if they drink pretty excessively, we have records of pirates keeping uh, codes or, or guidelines on their ships. And uh, in many of those, they have limitations on how much the pirates could drink at any given time in order to keep the crew um, ready for attack or, or uh, sailing through bad weather or whatever uh, that may be. So uh, as far as how pirates kind of influenced the consumption of rum, I would say that uh, if anything, the only way they kind of contributed to the consumption of rum is by uh, stealing it and then taking it to places where it may not have normally been um, shipped to. Uh, or bringing more quantities than a location may have been uh, privy to previously. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jamie, for that very, uh, very full uh, response. Um, do we have another question in the box? I think we do. Um, so, how, yeah, it's Phil, Phil again. So, how, when does the fetishization start if it is fetishized? 
I would say that we the the beginnings of pirates and rum as a an association probably comes from Treasure Island um, because uh, Robert Louis Stevenson references uh, rum quite frequently throughout the text, and then that got perpetuated in film adaptations. And uh, so you've got the film adaptations of Treasure Island, which then led to pirate films like Errol Flynn and and Blackbeard, and it just sort of proliferated from there. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jamie, and thank you for that, Phil. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any questions. Um, <coughs> For Jamie, if you do um, put them in the box, um, if not, yeah, groggy is the word. That's how I'm feeling. It's not rum related, unfortunately. It's all COVID related. So, if there are if there are no more questions, and of course, Jamie, you have to get to work as well um, virtually. Um, so, if there, are, <laughs> if there are no more questions, uh, I am tempted to wrap things up uh, and get back to the uh, to the sick bed. Um, but yeah, um, thank you uh, to, to all of you uh, for coming, and particularly to, to Jamie um, for this absolutely fascinating. Um, overview um, of pirates and rum. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much, Jamie, and particularly for, for getting up so uh, it's early in the morning. <laughs> it's eight o'clock in Washington DC. Um, so uh, yeah, the seminar series. We will actually be back um, in the new year. We've had to do some rescheduling because of uh, strike-related things. But uh, Jonathan Jones, um, I think it's on the twelfth of January, uh, will be uh, giving us a fascinating talk on opiates um, in uh, antebellum. Uh, American uh, medicine. I've popped up the link to the schedule where you can uh, you can book on for that. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, everyone, and thank you so much, Jamie. That was uh, absolutely uh, fantastic. It really was. Thank you. Um, yep. Enjoy the rest of your days. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Up so. Uh, it's so early in the morning. <laughs> it's eight o'clock in Washington, D.C. Um, so, uh, yeah, the seminar series, we will actually be back um, in the new year. We've had to do some rescheduling because of uh, strike related things. But uh, Jonathan Jones, um, I think it's on the 12th of January, uh, will be uh, giving us a fascinating talk on opiates um, in uh, antebellum uh, American uh, medicine. I've popped up the link to the schedule where you can uh, you can book on for that. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, everyone. And thank you so much, Jamie. That was uh, absolutely uh, fantastic. It really was. Thank you. Um, yep. Enjoy the rest of your days. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.